The Drag Race season 14 finale is upon us today, and I know a lot of you are big fans, as am I, and there's been some chitter chatter on the interwebs about RuPaul rigging the golden ticket situation. If you're new here, each queen was given a chocolate bar at the beginning of the season, and one was golden. Each queen opened her candy bar after losing a lip sync, and if she got the golden bar, she got to stay to slay another day. Bosco was the lucky gal with the golden ticket, and now she's gonna be in the finale as one of the top five girls. Now I had someone slide into my DMs, so sorry, I don't remember who it was, but they were asking me if there's anything illegal if RuPaul were to have rigged this golden ticket situation. People are throwing around allegations that the golden ticket was planted purposefully, that it wasn't by chance, that the girls didn't keep their chocolate bar on them at all times, and the show was able to orchestrate who ended up staying. This is all talk and chatter and nothing's been confirmed, and I'm certainly not interested in a defamation lawsuit, so I'm not saying whether any of this is true or not, because we simply do not know. Anyway, this person was in my DMs and was like, oh my God, are there laws against this? Did they break RuPaul laws? And I f at first was like, <laughs> That's a dumb question. Why the hell would Congress write laws about reality shows or game shows? Who has time for that? They all signed a contract saying RuPaul could do what she wanted and that's that. There's no way lawmakers are getting involved in this. Like there aren't federal crimes about game shows. Wrong. About the federal game show crimes at least. We'll talk about if they apply to Drag Race in a second, but y'all there is some drama and scandal in the history of game show law in the US. So I decided in honor of the season finale of Drag Race and all my subscribers who I know love the show, let's talk about game show drama. First, a real quick thanks to my partner on today's video. You know her, Atlas VPN. Atlas VPN is a virtual private network which makes all of your internet traffic travel through a protected encrypted tunnel. This way it protects you from spying, public Wi-Fi dangers, and it hides your IP address. Atlas VPN protects you from pop-up ads, malware, and other spooky things on the internet. It also allows you to surf the web from anywhere in the world. All of your streaming services like Netflix, HBO, etc., they all have geo restrictions because of licensing rights. But using Atlas VPN, you can surf the internet as though you are in any country throughout the world. So you can access these streaming services in other geographic locations that you otherwise wouldn't normally have access to. You want to see something on the Australian version of Netflix? Now you can with Atlas VPN. I also love to use it because I'm a person on the internet and I understand the importance of protecting myself while I'm online. Plus, I'm constantly creeped out by targeted ads for things I've been Googling or talking to my friends about. Get out of my head. Okay. Atlas VPN protects you across multiple devices. Protection for all. And with Atlas VPN, you can get the best VPN deal on the market. Right now, Atlas VPN is running a huge discount, meaning you can get a three year subscription to Atlas VPN for $1.99 a month. And there's a 30 day money back guarantee. That's an 82% discount just for you. You can get your deal by clicking on the link in the description down below. Thanks Atlas VPN. All right, let's get down and dirty with some game show law, shall we? People love trivia, my friends, and this is not a new phenomenon. Back in the early 1900s, quiz shows on the radio were very popular. For example, one radio show called Information Please rewarded listeners if they submitted a question that stumped an expert panel on the air. And then when TV came along, it was only natural for those quiz shows to transfer to TV. The first TV game show aired in 1938. It was called Spelling Bee, and it was just that. They had kids come on and try to spell shit. Riveting. Anyway, then World War II happened, and for a number of years, people were a little preoccupied with other stuff. So game shows stalled until after the war when they they really picked up speed. Some of the earliest shows in the 40s and 50s included one called This Is The Misses, which made women do weird things to compete against each other, like blow up balloons until they exploded or bark like dogs and do other animal impressions. Then there was one called Queen For A Day, which ran for two decades. And in each episode, four women would be interviewed by the host, Jack Bailey, and they would tell their sad stories about their lives, kids with cerebral palsy, dead husbands, etc. And then the host would ask them what would make their lives better, a new washing machine, a car, a vacation, and then the audience would vote on who deserved to be titled queen for a day and receive the prize she'd been asked for. They voted by clapping, which was measured by an applause meter, and people ate this shit up. Then a case came down from the Supreme Court in 1954, the FCC versus American Broadcasting Company, or ABC. The FCC had been denying radio and TV licenses to stations that were holding giveaways that required people to answer questions correctly. They called it similar to gambling. The Supreme Court was like, nah, as long as the contestants don't have to pay any of their 
own money in order to participate, it's not gambling and it's fine. So then game shows were like, sick, let's run with this. And a lot of shows started popping up that awarded big sums of money to contestants. One was called the $64,000 question, which paid winners $64,000, which is equivalent to about $600,000 today, if the contestant was able to beat experts on trivia in their own field. And there was a game called 21, which put two players against each other in a trivia game, but each had to be in an isolation booth wearing headphones. And these were a huge hit because they naturally created tension, made people want to play along at home, and utilized audience reaction and dramatic lighting and sound to really rev people up. And it turned these contestants into huge celebrities. One of these celebrities was a guy named Charles Van Doren, who did a multi-show broadcast of the show 21 against the reigning champion of the show. The reigning champ was this nerdy guy named Herb Stemple, and Charles was more clean cut and handsome, so the juxtaposition really got viewers invested, especially when handsome Charles beat out that nerd Herb. Charles became famous because of the show, but what people didn't know is the show was completely rigged. Remember that nerd Herb? Yeah, he had been coached to be an antagonist, to be pitted against more lovable contestants like Charles, and everything from his clothing to his language was coached and set for him, and he would be told the questions and answers ahead of time. So he lost to Charles on purpose, and he was willing to do this because he had apparently been promised a high salary job on the network, which he never got. So Stemple and others came forward about these shows being rigged, and it led to a flurry of drama, my friends. The Manhattan District Attorney convened a grand jury that heard over 150 witnesses. This led to a congressional inquisition as to the rigging of game shows, with one former contestant showing up with proof of the questions and answers he had been given. As it was happening, he wrote himself notes and mailed them to himself as contemporaneous evidence. Kind of brilliant. A number of people, including Handsome Charles, admitted to lying under oath to the Manhattan Grand Jury, and it's estimated that two thirds of the grand jury witnesses committed perjury. After this congressional investigation, in 1960, Congress amended the Communications Act of 1934 to prohibit rigging quiz shows. Specifically, 47 USC section 509 states that it shall be unlawful for any person with intent to deceive the listening or viewing public to engage in any scheme for the purpose of pre-arranging or predetermining in whole or in part the outcome of a purportedly bona fide contest of intellectual knowledge, intellectual skill, or chance. Interestingly, a poll taken by the Miami Herald around 1960 when all of this was going down showed that the public didn't really care if the games were rigged, most just wanted them to come back on the air. One person said, everything on TV is somewhat of a lie, but it's still entertainment. And ain't that the truth. Now if, in the hypothetical situation that the drag race golden ticket was placed intentionally, meaning Bosco was not brought back by chance or by the whim of the drag gods, but intentionally by the show, which again, we don't know whether that's true or not, but hypothetically, if it is, there would still be a lot of questionable aspects of this section of the Communications Act and whether it applies here. For example, the show is available via streaming services over the internet, which are outside the purview of the FCC, which only regulates broadcasting companies. However, it is also viewable on VH1, which operates more like a broadcasting company. But this amendment was made specifically regarding game shows shows that deal with trivia questions. Is this still applicable to a reality show involving drag queens? Maybe. The section I highlighted set a context of intellectual knowledge, intellectual skill, or chance. Chance is certainly involved in the golden ticket portion of this show, but it's less involved in the overall contest, which is supposedly based on the skills of the drag queens. Do those skills count as intellectual skills, or are they artistic skills? Performance skills. Do those count? I don't know. But in order for this section of the Communications Act to be enforced, the FCC would need to be made aware that this was happening, probably via a consumer complaint filed with them. Then the FCC would need to determine whether there's enough evidence and the situation is sufficiently worth their time to bring any sort of lawsuit to enforce this law. I'm gonna be real honest, I don't see the FCC thinking it's worth it. The overall outcome of the contest is still largely based on skill, not the golden ticket, and it's a reality TV program created in a time when the general public is certainly well aware that reality TV should always be taken with a grain of salt. It was true in 1960 and it's still true today. Everything on TV is somewhat of a lie, but it's still entertainment. That's all friends, enjoy the season finale of Drag Race tonight. Thanks once again to Atlas VPN for partnering with me on this video. Reminder that Atlas VPN is running a huge discount, meaning that you can get a three year subscription to Atlas VPN for $1.99 a month, and there's a 30 day money back guarantee. That's an 82% discount just for you. You can get your deal by clicking on the link in the description down below. Thanks Atlas VPN. If you liked this video, you'll probably like this one where I help break down the Drag Race contract that contestants have to sign. This was back when I had never seen an episode of Drag Race. <laughs> Or there's this one where I attempt Trixie makeup while talking about drag race related lawsuits. Thanks so much for watching. Have a good day. Goodbye.